Um, okay, so today we're going to be talking about buildings, and uh, it's a topic that's near to my heart, something that I work on a lot in research. Um, so I probably have too many slides for today, um, so that means we'll probably just spill over into uh, Thursday's lecture as well. Um, before we dig in, I just wanted to note that um, we have posted homework number two. Um, so I think good job most people submitted and, and did, did just fine on homework number one. Homework number two has a similar format. Um, it is due on Saturday, February 3rd, uh, which is not the second, which in the initial announcement on, on Brightspace, I, I screwed that up. So sorry about that. Um, the structure of the second homework is similar to the first. It's a couple of kind of, you know, write down equations type problems and then um, a longer coding problem. And uh, the coding has to do with the EV charging policies that we talked about in the end of last lecture. So kind of in the last 20, 30 minutes after um, Ben from Flip had finished up. So um, there are three EV charging policies that we talked about in the lecture slides. And two of them, I think one of them is quite easy to code. One of them is, is kind of intermediate. And one of them is more challenging. Um, not super difficult, but just you know substantially more difficult than, than the, the first one, at least. So um, the first two policies uh, you'll do for, for credit. And then the third one will be part of an extra credit problem that you can choose to do or, or not, uh, whatever you want. Okay. Um, so with that being said, I think we'll just dig right in here uh, to talk about thermal modeling of buildings. So again, there's a lot of material in here and I probably won't get through it all, that's okay. Um, so we'll start with some background, uh, then go into what are called thermal circuit uh, models of buildings. And uh, we'll talk about low order, first order thermal circuits, and then um, how to find parameters for those models. Uh, and then we'll talk about higher order thermal circuits, which uh, actually are, are usually not necessary, uh, it turns out, but sometimes are, are useful tools to have in your kind of modeling toolkit. So we'll talk about those and then um, some control strategies for buildings, uh, things like how thermostats work and uh, how you can plug those into building software that you write yourself in MATLAB or Python or whatever. And then um, finally, and we'll probably get to this on Thursday, but uh, there's an analogy that you can draw between electrochemical energy storage in a battery and sort of electrothermal energy storage in uh, the fabric, um, basically the air and the building materials and things like that inside of a building. So we'll talk about a couple of ways in which you can view buildings as basically thermal batteries. Okay, so to dig in here first, um, so why uh, why would we focus on thermal modeling of buildings and and not you know modeling lighting and and cooking and things like that? Well, it turns out that the the thermal stuff, basically the the heating, the cooling, the ventilation, uh, the water heating and refrigeration, uh, those things dominate both energy use and electricity use in buildings. Um, so here I've uh, got the percent of the, the usage in U.S. buildings on the y-axis, and on the x-axis here we're breaking it out by end use. And uh, the blue bars here represent energy. So that includes not just electrical energy, but also um, you know, natural gas and propane and heating oil and stuff like that. And then the orange bars are electricity. So you can see that for energy, um, so the other, this is everything else in buildings, is only about one third of energy use. And so the, the HVAC and R stuff is basically the, the remaining two thirds. And then for electricity, the, the breakdown is a little bit more even. So everything else is about half. And then the HVAC and R is, is the other half basically. And uh, as buildings move to having more uh, use of electricity for things like space heating and water heating, uh, I'd expect this um, everything else number to go down uh, and the HVAC numbers here to go up in the orange bars sort of over time. Um, but anyway, you can see that at least in terms of energy, um, space heating and water heating are the dominant things that make up half of energy use in buildings. And this is both commercial buildings, things like office buildings, uh, hospitals, uh, factories, and so forth, um, and residential buildings, so um, apartments, homes, condos, et cetera. Okay, so uh, it turns out that detailed thermal modeling of buildings is, is quite hard. And in my opinion, it's actually usually unnecessary. But this is just a, a sketch of the things that make, you know, true kind of physics-based, high-fidelity modeling of buildings challenging. Um, so I'm going to walk through this. So first of all, um, you know, we think of like, you know, asking a question like, what is the temperature in the house right now? What is the temperature in this room? And we think of that as having sort of just one answer, like, oh, it's 72 Fahrenheit, something like that. Um, but actually the temperature is, uh, it's different, you know, closer to a window or closer to, you know, all the computers and stuff that I'm standing by. I write heat sources will, will change the temperature in the room. And, and uh, also there's vertical stratification, hot air tends to rise. So near the ceiling, it'll be warmer than at the floor and so forth. So actually there's a three-dimensional temperature distribution in this room. 
Um, so, so we need to function, uh, specify basically a function in order to answer that question. What is the temperature in the room? And that function satisfies uh, what's called the heat equation, a partial differential equation, and, and, and here it's in three dimensions. Um, so alpha here is what's called the thermal diff diffusivity. T would be a, a function of three variables, um, a, a scalar valued function of three variables. That's the temperature in, in the space. Uh, little t is a time variable, and then you have the x, y, and z space coordinates. And there are various other terms here as well that can have to do with external forcings and, and things like that. Um, so that would give the temperature kind of inside this whole space, which is we think of as being kind of inside of a building. Um, this thing that's drawn here represents basically a window, and this thing over here represents a wall. Um, so coming through the window, we have basically sunlight, short wave electromagnetic radiation um, that can scatter, can uh, be transmitted, uh, you know, can do scattering over here and so forth. And uh, in general, to understand what was happening with the light coming in through a window, you'd need to do what's called ray tracing. Uh, so understand when this uh, you know, sunbeam scatters off this surface right here, how much of it is absorbed into the, the matter of the wall, how much of it bounces back into the room. Uh, you know, then when it bounces back, does it go through the window or does it get reflected again? And you can imagine how those computations get um, you know, complex pretty quickly, basically. So you got to do optics for that stuff. Uh, there's also thermal radiation. So, you know, we can imagine um, maybe this wall here is warm from all the sunlight that it's absorbing, but the window is cold. Maybe it's cold outside. So there'll be thermal radiative exchange between uh, this surface here, uh, the inner surface of the wall and the inner surface of the window. So some of that heat would get absorbed into the window itself and, and warm up the glass. And then it might re-radiate some of that uh, to the outward um, direction out into the outdoor air. Um, and then there's convection. Um, so if the surface is warmer than the outdoor air, we'll get thermal buoyancy effects happening here. And that'll cause uh, heat transfer basically from the solid uh, into the fluid, the air uh, that's convecting over it. And similarly, we might have hot air hitting a cooler window and uh, convecting downwards uh, on the inside surface there. And we have similar effects happening via convection, um, you know, here sort of at the both surfaces of the, of the wall. And then again, the temperature distribution within the wall here uh, would not necessarily be spatially uniform and would be governed by, again, a PDE that looks something like this. And then you have sources of heat coming from inside of the room. So um, my body, uh, everybody's body basically is something like a 100 watt light bulb in terms of the amount of energy that we give off to a space. And we do that through radiation and also through conduction, uh, sorry, convection of air that, that uh, you know, migrates over our bodies. Uh, things like lights, you know, uh, the electricity that goes into a light uh, gets radiated around and scattered and eventually ends up uh, as heat. And then the stuff that we plug in, you know, the, the power brick that's charging my laptop right now is emitting maybe 60 watts, and, and that's basically turning into heat in the space as well. And that stuff may enter through conduction, through convection, or, or through radiation. So you can imagine that keeping detailed account of all of those different effects is a challenging exercise, right? The equations may not be that difficult to write down, but specifying all the appropriate data, the, the geometry, the material properties and all that is, is a challenge. And then solving the equations can also be difficult. So we're not gonna do any of that, <laughs> but there is software that does that stuff for you if that's what you really feel like you need to do. Um, so one of them is called Energy Plus, uh, widely used software developed by the US Department of Energy. Uh, it's an open source uh, simulation tool, and there are a variety of uh, graphical sort of front ends built for Energy Plus. Another is TRANSYS, uh, which stands for Transient System Simulation. Uh, this was developed in the 1970s and into the 80s. Um, and basically before that, most building simulation tools were all uh, operating in steady state. So that was kind of a new thing to, to do with full dynamic equations. And then more recently, uh, de with DOE support uh, as well, um, researchers have developed what's called the Buildings Library for a tool called Medelica. So has anybody used Medelica before? Uh, I see we've got one, one Medelica person in here. Um, so, you know, Medelica is basically a, a dynamic modeling language that can solve ODEs and PDEs and, and coupled nonlinear equations and things like that. Um, it's a pretty powerful tool and the buildings library basically has canned components that can plug into those tools um, and so forth. So um, these programs are, are broadly applicable and, and they're very powerful. Um, they have you know, solvers under the hood that have you know, a lot of smart people have put a lot of time into optimizing, um, but they do require many, many parameters. So if we think about just this room, you know, specifying all the parameters that influence heat transfer in here, you'd have to think about you know, what is the wattage of the light bulbs? What's the thermal conductivity and the emissivity and the absorptivity of all the surfaces? Uh, what are the geometric orientations, right? Like how long is the room? How wide is the room? How tall is the room? What are the areas of the windows and things like that? So quickly, uh, the task of just specifying all those numbers 
uh, gets difficult and specifying them accurately uh, gets even more difficult. Um, so ideally what we'd like to be able to do is maybe fit some of those parameters or some kind of simpler representation of the basic parameters um, using data. And it's quite challenging to do that with these uh, you know, high powered simulation tools. Uh, they can also sometimes be slow. Um, so they're solving a couple nonlinear PDEs in general, and that can be a challenging numerical uh, task. And they can be difficult to integrate with other software. Um, now th there are tools, kind of bridge uh, tools that allow integration of all of these tools with other software for uh, doing things like you know, statistical fitting of models, um, optimizing parameters or operation of, of models. But, um, but it's not sort of natively an easy thing to do. So um, in this class, the approach that I'd like to take basically is to use simpler models that represent kind of the core of the physics in buildings without getting into all that super detailed um, calculation. So the idea here is I don't want to teach you everything there is to know about building physics, right? I want to make you dangerous, right? I, <laughs> I want to make, give you the ability to like simulate something and have it look pretty reasonable, to have a model that you can fit the parameters of and have it reasonably represent something that's happening in the real world. So. Okay, so let's talk about how to do that. Um, so the basic tool, or at least one of the basic tools for kind of simplified modeling of, of heat transfer in, in buildings, also you know, refrigerators and, and other devices, um, is, uh, is to use what, what's called a thermal circuit. And uh, they operate by analogy to electrical circuits with temperature playing the role of voltage or electrical potential, uh, heat playing the role basically of charge, or if you like the flow of heat playing the, ro the role of current. And then uh, there's a clear analog between uh, resistance on the electrical side and on the thermal side and capacitance as well. And so the basic idea of these models is that um, differences in the, the potential, the, the temperature, uh, drive differences in heat flow, just like differences in voltage within a circuit drive current flow, charge flow or, or current. So, so here's basically the, the simplest um, circuit that can reasonably represent what's happening inside of a, a room or a building. And it's called 1R1C, so that just means one resistor and one capacitor. And uh, you can draw it just like you draw an electrical circuit. Uh, so here we have ground. Um, this capacitance basically is an energy storing element. So you could think of this as the, the air uh, inside of a room. T, so this is just kind of one measurement of the temperature. So you could think of this as what maybe that wall thermostat over there would be measuring. R, this is the thermal resistance between that uh, node T and then theta here, which kind of denotes a, a generic boundary temperature. Um, so for the example of this room, that theta might be the outdoor air temperature, or 35 Fahrenheit or whatever it is. Uh, and then this here represents basically a battery um, saying that we're going from the ground uh, up to whatever that is, the 35 at the boundary there. And then this module over here is a, a current source. And so we have Q uh, from, I've broken that into C for, for controlled equipment, and then E for exogenous sources, things that aren't uh, controlled, basically. And so we have heat transfer happening from both of those. Um, okay. Yeah, so the units on these things, so typically we'd use Celsius or centigrade for, um, for the temperature, and then R would have units of temperature divided by power, so degrees per kilowatt. And then the thermal capacitance would have units of energy per um, degree, so kilowatt hours per degree Celsius typically. And then these Qs, the low, lowercase Qs, um, so in like a thermodynamics or heat transfer class, you'd probably write a capital Q with a dot on it to represent the rate of heat transfer um, in units of kilowatts or something like that. And here, just to keep notation a little bit lighter, I'm just using a lowercase Q. Uh, typically, lowercase Q in a heat transfer class would be like a heat flux, like a watts per square meter kind of a thing. Uh, and, and we don't really need, need that in this class. So. And anyway, so this QC, this is going to come from, you know, the, the radiator in this room or the air conditioner that might blow cool air through those ducts. And then QE, this is coming from sort of everything else. So this is body heat. It's the heat coming off of lights. Um, it's uh, maybe sunlight coming in through the windows if we happen to have any of that today and so forth. Okay, so we can write down governing equations for this first order thermal circuit. Um, and so basically we have analogs to, to Ohm's law and um, to uh, Kirchhoff's laws or Kirchhoff, Kirchhoff um, for, for circuits. And they carry right over from the world of electrical circuits into the world of thermal circuits. Um, so here Ohm's law basically says that um, you know, V delta V is equal to IR. Um, so the change in voltage here divided by R would be equal to the current um, flowing through the resistor or the heat transfer in this case. 
And then um, if you remember from your uh, direct current circuits, the rate of charge accumulation on a capacitor is just its capacitance times uh, in the electrical world, dV by dt, the, the time derivative of voltage. And so in the thermal world, that becomes the time derivative of the temperature. And then if we use uh, Kirchhoff's current law, which basically just says at any node, the sum of the currents going in equals the sum of the currents coming out. So if we apply that at the node up here that we've labeled with a capital T, we get that the current inflow, so that's just this stuff on the left-hand side, it branches in two directions. And so one of these is given by Ohm's law across the resistor. And the other one is given by the rate of charge accumulation on the capacitor, because that's equal to the current that's coming into this plate of the capacitor. OK, so then we can just write down those equations. We have a QC plus QE on the left-hand side. We have a delta T divided by R plus a C uh, times the time derivative of T. Oops, and this derivative here, this should be a lowercase t, not a capital T. OK, so we can rearrange that and, and put the state variable, the temperature on the left-hand side, and then we get basically a, a first-order linear ODE. Um, just like we uh, you know, talked about in the last couple of weeks when we were doing the modeling and the simulation, and, and, and just like we did for the, the batteries section last week. So um, I may or may not actually give you this as a homework problem because there's one this week for the, the batteries section that's very similar. Um, but basically, um, if you have uh, piecewise constant input signals, so the theta and the Qs, uh, and a constant time step, you know, delta T could be a minute or an hour or something like that, but as long as it's not changing from one time to the next, then we get this nice, clean, discrete time uh, equation that represents the dynamics of the building or the room. So the new uh, temperature, rather, is just equal to a constant A times the old temperature, plus 1 minus A times the resistance times the heat, essentially, that's being injected into the space. And uh, that's broken out into the control component, and then W, uh, a sort of disturbance term that I've written down here. So that's equal to this heat from exogenous sources, again, sunlight, electronics, lights, bodies, et cetera, um, plus uh, theta divided by R. And it turns out that if you take temperature and divide it by uh, thermal resistance, you get units of power. Um, so this works out here. Uh, and the parameter A here, um, so this just comes from solving the underlying uh, linear differential equation. So A is just e to the minus delta T divided by the time constant um, associated with the, the model, which is just R times C. So if you go back and look at the units of R and C, you can see that if you multiply degrees per kilowatt, times kilowatt hours per degree, you get hours. And so that's a, a thing that has units of time and it, it enters as a, a time constant in the, uh, the differential equation. Okay, so that's a 1R, 1C circuit. Um, you can also do other first order circuits that have connections to other temperatures. Um, so for example, in this room, we might have a thermal connection to the outdoor air temperature, say the 35 Fahrenheit, but we might also have thermal connect, uh, connection to the temperature out in, in that space, uh, the, the doorway outside there, um, which might be at you know, 60 or 65 Fahrenheit if this room is at 72. So we could add that um, as an additional temperature. Um, alternatively, we could say that the air in this room is thermally connected to the, the thermal mass of the stuff, the concrete in this case, the cinder blocks that, that make up the, the beautiful construction in this classroom. And uh, so we could specify a temperature for that stuff. It's probably on that wall, you know, cooler than it is uh, in the room. And on this wall, it might be, you know, roughly the same temperatures as the indoor air. So anyway, we can specify a mass temperature and an outdoor temperature. And then we could have thermal resistances connecting the indoor temperature T uh, to each of those. And then we have, um, again, our, our R's and our C for the space uh, hasn't changed. And the interpretations here of the QC and the QE also haven't changed. And so in this model, um, all the heat injection is coming into the air in a space. Um, but you could also imagine a term like this, a, a current source being injected over here to the, the mass. So for example, if you had sunlight hitting a, you know, a black painted wall that had a lot of thermal mass, you might have direct uh, heat transfer from the sun into that uh, massive wall. Anyway, I'm just kind of sketching out what one model can look like here. So again, if we do uh, Kirchhoff's current law, law of conservation of charge, basically, um, at the node labeled T in the thing, we get um, this uh, differential equation that governs the dynamics. And uh, you can kind of see how that works. So we have the heat source coming in here, and then it's splitting now in three ways. So we should have three terms on the right-hand side. One is the rate of charge accumulation here. Uh, and then we have two Ohm's law type things, uh, delta T divided by R, R type things. Yes, Alex. Um, I have a question about the capacitance. Yes. Yep. So what does that like, represent? Is it 
So what does the capacitance in the model represent physically? Um, so it kind of depends on what you're modeling. But in the simple case where we're thinking about, um, you know, this C here basically, rep or this T rather, representing the air temperature in, in this room, uh, then C would be the thermal capacitance of the air inside of here. So if we took the, the volume of air uh, and multiplied it by the density of the air, and then the specific heat capacity of the air at constant pressure, probably, we would get a number that had these units of, of energy per degree. And that roughly is the thermal capacitance here. Um, now, if we had a different capacitance associated with the, the mass temperature over here, um, then that would basically represent the thermal mass of the walls, floors, et cetera, that makes up the building. Um, that's right. Yeah. Um, so, so the comment was, so for every basically degree of temperature increase of the indoor air, the energy stored, the, the heat basically stored in the indoor air increases by an amount C times yeah, one, so, <laughs> right? Or one degree, basically. Yeah. Yep, that's right. And then the battery, that's like why it comes right after the thermal mass. Mm -hmm. Where would be like the force of that? So the, the battery over here that represents or that, that attaches to the thermal mass, what would be the source of that? Um, so that's actually a, a good and subtle question. Um, so maybe a more natural way to represent this, and we'll talk about this model in a sec, but would be to put another capacitance here. Um, so rather than basically having an, an energy source, a battery, you'd have another heat storing element. And then there would be heat transfer into that thing from the indoor air in this model. Right, you'd have heat basically flowing along this path and warming or, or cooling the, the mass. Right. Um, the battery model here is kind of like this is assuming that that mass temperature is basically constant, um, or it can be changing over time, but it doesn't have any heat storage in it. So it's somehow exogenous to the model. It's not a state in the model in this setup. In the real world, it's mostly coming from the Yeah, so the, the comment is in the real world, it's mostly coming from the indoor temperature. And, and that's right. So if, if, um, like that wall uh, opposite us, which has surface facing outside is a good example. So, so that wall normally would be pretty cold. And if we stopped heating the room inside, it would just eventually become the same temperature as the outdoor air. But because we are heating the indoor air um, through that radiator back there, the air gets warm and then uh, heat basically transfers from the air into that wall and warms it up. So that becomes essentially the heat source. Does that make sense? Okay, great questions, thank you. Um, and yeah, if anybody else has questions, please, um, just raise your hand or, or speak up. Actually, I was kind of um, just wanted to make sure I understood the like the ground element. So, like in the analysis of temperature being voltage, that could that makes sense that it's like the outdoor temperature. There's like a capacitor and resistance in between the indoor and the outdoor temperatures, right? But then I guess yeah, like I'm still trying to connect the battery wall element. Or are those also just ground? Um, okay, so you're you're trying to understand basically the the ground and and the batteries that I've drawn here, right? Um, so let me take a stab at explaining that, and um, if it's not clear, I'll, I'll take a different stab, I guess. But so in an electrical circuit, uh, circuit, basically ground is kind of an arbitrary thing, right? It's it's sort of a number that you pick. It could be you know 100 volts, or it could be a genuinely a, a zero volt thing. Um, and then batteries are basically things that, that raise the voltage, sort of a, a fixed amount um, relative to whatever you've declared as, as ground. So here, I think the same kind of holds. So we could declare this as, like it doesn't have to be absolute zero, right? It, it could be, say, the outdoor temperature. It could just be the 35 that we have. And in that case, we could get rid of this battery component here because the outdoor temperature would be at the temperature of the ground, right? Um, but if we think of it as, as maybe this is absolute zero, Right, so so zero Kelvin or negative two seventy three Celsius, and then this is, I don't know, whatever it is, about zero Celsius. So in some sense, there's some energy source that's raising the outdoor air from absolute zero up to zero Celsius, and I don't know, that's whatever the sun or something like that. Yeah, that's just more to formulate our problem. Correctly. Yeah, it's basically a way to to formulate the problem correctly and to to draw something that you can a little bit wrap your head around that corresponds to the yeah. equations. And then those equations um, have reasonable physical accuracy, right? Not perfect, but pretty good. Um, and just a note on the history of this thermal circuit modeling. So, so back in the day before, before there were digital computers, or at least that were good and, and fast and small and cheap and stuff, um, people who wanted to simulate thermal behavior of stuff 
um, whether it's a, a building or you know a, a refrigerator or whatever, um, rather than having to build the full device and run it kind of in, in real time, they would build a thermal circuit representation of it and, and they would use a real analog circuit, like they would actually make it on, on a board, right? Um, and then they would get the voltages and the resistance tuned just right so that they you know, represented kind of a scaled version of, of the device that they were simulating. And then they would just run the circuit and they would measure the temperatures and they would kind of you know, take notes, right? And that would describe like, oh, that's the energy use of the building or, or whatever it is. Um, so again, not perfect models, but um, yeah, now they have these computational advantages. They're sort of low order, they're linear, they don't have too many parameters and so forth. And so they're, they're useful for us. But yeah, all this stuff is, is very much just approximation. Okay, great question. Thank you. Any others? Okay, so here is our governing equation, um, and I think you can convince yourself that you know after you rearrange some terms, this kind of falls out of uh, of the circuit model. And again, I may or may not supply this as homework. I thought I would, but. Who knows? Um, but you can take this 2R1C model, and, and uh, just like you may have done in like a physics 2 class, an ENM class, you can reduce uh, a 2R1C circuit to a 1R1C circuit by defining what's called an equivalent resistance and an equivalent boundary temperature. Um, so here, we can turn this thing, which has, you know, whatever, three terms on the right-hand side, to something that just has two terms, uh, one delta T divided by R term, and then one kind of heat transfer forcing term. And so, you know, you can show if you do a little bit of math that uh, the R that shows up in here is the product of the R's between the, the air and the thermal mass and the air and the outdoor, indoor air and the outdoor air, uh, divided by the sum of those R's. And then the theta is basically a mixture, a weighted average of the two temperatures, the temperatures of the thermal mass and, and the outdoor. And so in this way, we can take kind of a, a higher order um, model with more parameters, and we can streamline it and simplify it and, and represent it with that first uh, order 1R1C circuit that uh, I showed in the last slide. Okay, and then it turns out you can do a similar thing with an arbitrary uh, number of boundary temperatures. As long as you just have one energy storing element, you can always reduce it to basically a 1R1C model with an appropriately defined boundary temperature and, and resistance. So here, um, the C, again, represents basically the energy storage uh, uh, capability of the, say, indoor air, if we're talking about a room. And then T would be, you know, again, still just what's measured at a, at a thermostat. And all this stuff would be, you know, the sunlight, the body heat, and, and the you know, heat coming out of the radiator and things like that. And then now we have connections to a number N of boundary temperatures. So this T1 might be the outdoor air, uh, the TN might be the air in the hallway. We might have a thermal mass temperature for this wall and another one for that wall and one for the ceiling, one for the floor. And so you could have an arbitrary number of these things. It could be five, it could be five million. Um, and then uh, you can write down again from doing just a, a current balance or charge balance at, at this uh, node, you can write down basically that um, this thing coming in equals all the currents that are flowing out. And the flowing, current flowing out down here is again equal to the rate of charge accumulation on the capacitor. And so we get this uh, di ordinary differential equation. It's first order, it has one state, T with no subscript, and then it has a whole bunch of boundary terms, all the TIs. And uh, again, maybe, maybe for homework, maybe not, um, but if you do a little bit of algebra, you can again show that uh, you can reduce that to the basic kind of canonical 1R1C model that we started with. Um, so if you define R, again, as the product of all the little R's divided by uh, this stuff in the denominator here. And then uh, theta, again, is a weighted average of all the temperatures kind of weighted by these products of, of resistances. So this is a little more involved to show, but, but still not uh, terribly difficult. So anyway, the point is that this 1R1C model is actually really powerful. Uh, it can represent and model actually a, a wide variety of stuff. Um, the basically, the only limitation is that um, you kind of are only thinking about one heat storing element. If you really care about two heat storing elements, like the air in two rooms, or you really care about the heat that you're getting in the thermal mass of the space, um, then you want more of these capacitances uh, in the model, and that'll lead to a higher order of your differential equation. And we'll talk about that in, in just a sec. Okay, but before we get to these higher order thermal circuit models, which you know are somewhat more complex, and in my view, often not necessary, um, but a, you know, a good tool to have in the toolbox. Um, but before we get there, I wanna talk about um, basically how we get the Rs and the Cs and the Qs that show up uh, in these models. So there are kind of three flavors, three types of parameters that show up in these thermal circuit models. 
We have a thermal resistance. And this one I think is actually the most challenging to specify accurately. Um, so our TA, Creator Sean, is working on a, a large modeling study uh, that involves looking at thousands of, of buildings and the impact on switching all the you know, heating and the space heating and stuff like that, the driving that people do in those uh, communities from gasoline and natural gas over to electricity. And uh, one really challenging thing that we found in that modeling study is getting appropriate values of this thermal resistance R um, because it's really influential on what the simulation results look like. So um, we'll talk in some detail about that. And then there's the thermal capacitance C, which is usually easier to specify as long as you know kind of the materials you're looking at and, and the shape of them. Uh, and then there's the Q uh, from exogenous sources, again, sunlight and uh, body heat and so forth. And, and that one is usually not too bad to specify. So let's talk about R. Um, so typically you can model R if we just think about the one R, one C model. And if we assume that the, the theta, the boundary temperature, that that thing is the outdoor air temperature. Um, so then you can model R reasonably well as the reciprocal of the thing called U here, which is the thermal transmittance or, or U value times A, where this A is the outward facing surface area of uh, basically the exterior surfaces of the, the space or, or of the building. So here A would have units of square meters and then U, uh, the transmittance has units of power divided by temperature times area, basically. Okay, um, so we basically need to figure out what's a reasonable value of A and what's a reasonable value of U. And A will come from basically geometry. Uh, and I'd like to kind of simplify that geometry so that it becomes a function essentially only of things that you can get uh, by basically just conversation with someone about a building or from looking at Google Maps or something. So basically we wanna boil down this uh, area, wall area, uh, as basically a function of just the floor area. Like if you ask somebody, how many square feet is your apartment? They might say, oh, 500 square feet. Like that's a number that most people know or that you can get from looking at, you know, uh, Street View or whatever on, on Google Maps. And then, uh, and then something else, which is how many stories are, uh, is the building. So again, something that's easy to find. Um, and then you, this thing comes from just knowing a little bit about building materials, basically. Um, so two Interesting things, important things to know are, uh, are the U value for windows and for the sort of non-window, the opaque parts of walls. So, um, so triple pane windows have the lowest U. So U basically represents how, how conductive something is. Um, so it's sort of the reciprocal of the insulation or the R value. Um, so we get about one watt per degree square meter. And note the usage of watts here, not kilowatts. So all the other stuff that I described was in KW. So when we take these numerical values, we always have to convert them to KW first before plugging them into formulas. Um, anyway, uh, U of about one for a triple pane window. So three panes of glass typically separated either by some insulating clear material or just a uh, vacuum. And then that includes the, the framing. So like the plastic or the metal or whatever that goes around the window. And that's pretty much the best you can possibly find. So triple pane with what's called a low E or low emissivity coating to decrease basically thermal radiation uh, heat transfer through the window um, gets you to about U equal one. And then the worst you can find is a, a single pane window um, you know, with a metal frame probably. Something like that ends up being about six uh, watt per square meter degree. And then um, framed and insulated uh, walls, you'd expect to be significantly lower uh, heat transfer than windows, so less conductivity. And that ends up being the case. So kind of the best you can find for a wall that's basically pure insulation and, and pretty thick insulation is about 0 0.2. And then kind of a typical wall, um, you know, might be in the middle there. And, and, and the worst you'd find is kind of order one uh, watt per degree square meter. So here is just a picture of what a typical wall assembly for uh, a house might look like. Um, so these are, you know, what are called the studs, and they're typically two by fours or two by sixes, which are not exactly two inches by four or six inches. It's like some smaller measurement, but um, anyway, it's roughly two inches by maybe six inches or four inches or, or six inches of depth. And these are usually maybe a foot and a half apart, something like that. And then of course we have the windows over here and in between the studs is typically some form of insulation. Uh, and that could be, I, I don't know, I got this from a, a website about rock wool. So it could be rock wool or it could be, um, you know, some kind of plastic or, or um, I don't know, a manufactured material. And then there are typically holes in the insulation for stuff like wiring. So you can see here, um, I don't know, this might be, yeah, I think this is conduit for electrical wiring and there are holes for, you know, outlets and stuff like that. So those things act as what are called thermal bridges. 
Um, so basically the conductivity of, of wood or of metal is a lot higher than the thermal conductivity of, um, of the insulation. So heat you know, prefers basically to flow through places where the conductivity is better. And so you get more heat transfer through, for example, the studs than you get through the insulation. So this U that we're thinking of, that 0.2 to 0.8 range that I gave you is for kind of average over all of this. So if you look at this whole wall, it's kind of an impediment to heat transfer or, or a conductor of heat. Um, how good is it uh, overall? OK, so um, we talked about windows and we talked about walls. Now we'd like to combine them kind of into one overall U, uh, thermal transmittance for an entire uh, building envelope. And so there, we need to use a, a parameter that's called the wall to window ratio, WWR. And here I've used lambda to represent that. And so um, that's just the percentage of the entire area that is windows. So here, if we looked at this, I don't know, we could you know, run the calculation if we had the length and the height of this wall. Um, we could get its overall area. And then we could you know, do the same thing on the windows. And we'd probably include the window framing as well. And then that would give us the ratio of the window area to the total area. And so that would be lambda. OK, so if you know the transmittance for the window and for the wall, then, and if you know the wall to window ratio, uh, then you can combine them using this formula to get the overall U for uh, the, the entire wall assembly, including the windows, the framing, the insulation, the conduit, all that stuff. So that number, lambda, the, the window to wall ratio, is typically somewhere in the range of 20 to 40 percent, maybe 20 to 30, 40 might be a little bit high. Um, and so if we use that range and we use the numbers or the ranges for the U for the windows and U for the walls, we get somewhere kind of between one and one to two uh, watts per square meter uh, degree uh, Celsius for U. So this is not like, I'm not saying you can't find a building that has a lower U than this or that has a higher U than this, but this is kind of a typical range. So it's kind of order one. And uh, just here's what some windows look like. So like if you had to do a quick and dirty model of, of this building, for example, um, you could just walk around the perimeter of it and you could kind of eyeball it. And you could say, eh, what percentage of the window looks like, or sorry, what percentage of this whole surface looks like windows? And uh, you, know, you might find in here, I don't know, it's 15%, something like that, I guess. Um, so here's what walls with different uh, lambdas look like. Um, so 70% is actually in the, the super high end, and this is probably the highest you'd, you'd really ever find unless you had a, a building that was actually built out of glass. And uh, I don't know, if you walk around and look at houses, often a wall will look kind of like this, actually, kind of in the 10% range, but sometimes you'll find a, a bit more in there. Yes, question. There is a question about the uh, tolerance, like uh, statutory power between those in some parts. Uh, and other side of the window is above. But in those cases, do we have like two layer resistances or something like that? Um, sorry, could, could you rephrase that question? So uh, the whole power is powered with window, it's completely glass. Mm -hmm. But uh, in some parts, behind glass is also the bomb. So we have like two layers of resistance. Oh, I see. Okay. So, so what happened? I'm just going to rephrase for folks who are on Zoom, which I forgot to do with the other question. Sorry about that. <laughs> but um, imagine you have basically a tower where it has the an exterior surface that is all glass, but then kind of an intermediate surface that is not, and then it has the indoors beyond that, right? So then, yeah, I think what we would probably want to do is look for a U for that overall assembly, which would include, you know, the insulation in that interior wall. It would include something about the air. It's trapped in that space, which, you know, if it's really sunny, you might be doing weird convective stuff, right? And then it would include the, the glass as well. Right. So I don't have a number for what, what that might look like. It's an interesting problem. <laughs> Maybe I'll give it to you guys as a well, problem. <laughs> and you can all thank Karen for that. <laughs> no, I probably won't do that. Um, but anyway, yeah, so so obviously this is it's like way more complicated than I'm, I'm giving you like one number to represent the overall kind of conductivity of the entire envelope of a big building. And, and you can find one number, it's kind of a spatial average, but figuring it out from first principles is, is actually can be quite challenging, right? So you can imagine like just in that window, you've got framing, which is metal. You've got like sealant stuff, which is some kind of glue or plastic adhesive. You've got like metal down there from the radiator and there's cinder blocks on the outside. So just like looking up all the properties of all that stuff is, uh, is a challenge, right? Um, and of course, those things aren't known with perfect precision. So with each number you add in, it adds some uncertainty to the model and, and so forth. So anyway, I think it's it's very much worth bearing in mind that all of this stuff is approximate and all we're going for is sort of useful enough uh, for control and for design purposes. 
Uh, we're not really going for perfect accuracy, but that's a great question. Thank you. Okay, so just where we're going, why we're doing this. Um, so <laughs> again, we're trying to specify the, the resistance R and we've kind of broken that up into two parts. And one has to do with basically the physical properties and that's U. And the other one has to do basically with geometry and that's the area, the surface area. So we talked through uh, the physical part, let's talk through the geometric part. So if we think about um, basically a shoebox, you know, a uh, tight building. So of course, uh, the world of architecture is rich and diverse. Not every building is a, a shoebox, but it's a reasonable approximation of a lot of buildings. Uh, houses, you know, office buildings, et cetera, often have kind of a roughly boxy shape. Um, if they don't, often they can be approximated pretty well by a couple of boxes put together you know, to get an L shape or whatever. Okay, so um, if we define L as the length of the long uh, surface, um, so the, the longer dimension here of, of this box, and then alpha as the uh, aspect ratio. Um, so if this thing here was 80%, the length of this here, then alpha would be 0.8. Um, and then the floor area, AF. So again, this is something that, that people can tell you, you know, how big is your, your parents' house? Oh, it's uh, 2,400 square feet, something like that. Um, and so that includes all of the floor area. Um, so if it's a multi-floor building, it's all the floor area on the first floor and on the second floor, right? And maybe in the basement, and maybe in the attic as well, uh, depending on how people count. Um, so it's not just the footprint area, okay? So if there are N floors, then you get basically uh, a footprint that is the floor area divided by N. Does, does that make sense, that distinction? Okay. So um, we can write down what the floor area is. Well, the footprint is just alpha L times L, so that's alpha L squared. And then uh, the total floor area is going to be n times the footprint if we have n floors. So then we get alpha n l squared is the floor area. So then we can solve for l, and that just is the square root of a uh, divided by alpha n, right? So you move alpha n over, take the square root. And then we get the total wall area here, which is going to be the height of one wall, which is typically uh, for this, I mean, maybe three and a half or four meters uh, for a residential building, maybe three meters, something like that. Um, so if we take H and we multiply it by L, then we get the area of this surface, and we have two of those. And then if we take H and multiply it by alpha L, we get the area of this surface, and there are two of those as well. So we get two times the quantity one plus alpha times N L H. And the N comes from basically we have, you know, one, one surface here, and then for every floor we have an identical surface. So we have N copies of that. Okay, so then we take our expression for L, plug it in for the L down here, and uh, we get that the wall area is about two times one plus alpha with a divided by square root of alpha over here uh, times H times the square root of N times the floor area. <laughs> I'm not just doing algebra for the sake of doing algebra here, right? Uh, so we're trying to get to a formula that, that is useful uh, to get what the wall area is, or at least an estimate of the wall area as a function of how many floors we have and what's the floor area of the building. Okay, so it turns out that this thing, the one plus alpha divided by square root of alpha, it turns out that that thing is very close to two um, for pretty much any useful or interesting value of alpha. Um, so, you know, alpha equals one means that the footprint of this thing is a square. And then the smaller alpha gets basically the more, the more narrow that rectangle gets with alpha going to zero is essentially turns the building into like a line. Um, so anyway, 0.5 would be like quite a skinny building. You don't see a lot of those. Probably everything is above 0.75. And if we're at 0.75 or above, then this uh, approximation of the real function one plus alpha divided by root alpha uh, by just the number two, very simple approximation is accurate to 1% error. So for anything above this, we're within 1% of the true value. So that tells us that we can replace this one plus alpha divided by root alpha, that whole thing by two. And so uh, we get just two times two times H times uh, the quantity uh, or the square root here of N times the floor area. So again, N is something people can just tell you. A is something that people can just tell you. So this is a, a fairly simple thing. H is usually about three meters, um, but for a really, you know, a room with really high ceilings, it might be larger, four meters, something like that. Okay. Yeah. 1% error is the error between just the alpha and um, like a built model, like just like it's not the overall error between my simplified model um, to look at it. 
Yeah, so so when I say 1% error, what am I talking about here? And and no, it's not the overall error between like our simplified model and reality. <laughs> I think the, that error is probably way larger, <laughs> right? Um, all I'm saying is if you take this formula here, right, with has the alphas in it, and you approximate it by this formula down here, which is all, all we're doing is taking this function one plus alpha divided by square root of alpha. We're taking all the alpha stuff and just approximating it by the number two. So um, in that approximation, that is accurate to within like 1%. So it just simplifies the formula a, a little bit. We still have all the other simplifications and inaccuracies and so forth. Yes? So not your so question, but no, so are you taking into account the ceiling? Yeah, OK. So that's actually a really good question. And I thought about putting another slide in here. Um, for you <laughs> or for the hypothetical you who would ask that. Um, so we're not, uh, so the question is basically what about the area of the ceiling and I guess the area, the area of the floor as well, right? So um, why, are, why am I not including that in, in this estimate? Um, okay, so of course in reality there is heat transfer through roofs and there is heat transfer through foundations of buildings, right? Um, but typically, so the foundation is in contact with the ground which is usually uh, at a much more stable and mild temperature than the outdoor air. So maybe even in the middle of winter, you know, a couple of weeks ago when it got down to whatever, negative five Fahrenheit here, um, the ground, if you go, you know, 10 feet down the level of a foundation, um, it's probably 50, you know, 45, 50, 55, something like that Fahrenheit. So the Delta T is just smaller, basically. Um, also, usually there are no windows. We've seen that windows are a lot more uh, transmissive of, of heat um, or better conductors of heat than most building materials, opaque building materials. Um, so the lack of windows means that the overall um, U for those surfaces is going to be smaller. So smaller delta T, at least for the ground, and no windows, so smaller uh, U, means that the heat transfer through those surfaces is smaller. Now, is it negligible? No, probably not. Um, you know, not if you're trying to get really accurate. Um, but like nothing that we're doing in this model is accurate enough <laughs> to, to get to sort of, you know, the, the single digit percent errors where an approximation like that, I think really matters. Um, depending on the shape of the building, the, the roof losses might be more significant. So if you have a single story building with like, you know, a square footprint, then the ceiling area, the roof area is actually going to be um, bigger probably than, than the, um, the vertical surface area. So, um, so why are we neglecting that? So in that limit of you know, one story building, maybe it makes more sense to actually take into account the floor or the roof area as well. Um, but again, we get the fact that roofs are um, opaque. So there's no, typically no windows unless you have skylights, uh, which are somewhat unusual. Um, it's easy to just like throw a bunch of insulation into an attic. Um, so if you look at the R value of the insulation that goes in attics compared to walls, it's usually like three or four times higher in the attic. Um, and then there's a, a subtler point, which is that um, if you look at the called film coefficients in a heat transfer class, but basically the, the coefficient that relates um, a delta T, uh, say, between the air and, and a surface here, and, uh, and the rate of heat transfer from a surface into the air by convection. Um, so those, are, those coefficients are much bigger So uh, for vertical surfaces, basically because you have thermal buoyancy effects that drives currents, uh, convection cells, over vertical surfaces, and you don't really get those over horizontal surfaces. So that means that heat just doesn't transfer away from roofs as quickly as it does from walls. Too. Okay. So there's a bunch of <laughs> pseudo answers to your question. Um, but you know, if you wanted to be really accurate, you would also take into account the, the I think, at least the roof, and maybe the roof and the floor as well. Does that make sense? OK. All right. Um, Okay, so basically we have the, the wall area and we have the U from the previous slide and I'll show a summary in a sec about how those uh, merge together to get us basically a reasonable range um, for the R value, the thermal resistance. And then the capacitance is usually easier. Um, so as long as what we're talking about is the air inside of a building, um, which for controls, usually that is what we mean by you know the indoor temperature. It's the thing that gets measured at, at a thermostat. Um, then we can pretty reasonably model um, the thermal capacitance as uh, the density of air, rho, uh, times the specific heat value at constant pressure, Cp, uh, times the volume of the space. So rho, C, V, basically. And uh, yeah, rho and C, these are basically just constants. They do have some dependence on um, the temperature and, and the pressure of the air. I guess 
ma mainly the temperature. Um, but uh, but at you know reasonable kind of room temperature values, they're they're pretty much constant. And then V is the the volume enclosed um, by the surfaces that we're looking at, and so that's just the floor area times um, the height H of of one floor. Okay, um, so if you just run those calculations and then you put them into a model, you typically get a sort of a model that responds unreasonably or unphysically fast to changes in things like you know, sunlight or outdoor temperature or what you're doing with the heating or, or cooling equipment. Uh, and the reason for that is that there's some unmodeled thermal capacitance typically. Um, so if we only look at the air, we're missing material that is like pretty tightly thermally coupled to the air. Um, so for example, like the, whatever it is, steel or aluminum that's making up the vents uh, that heat is coming through. So those are roughly you know, um, isothermal with the air in here, but they have significant thermal mass of their own. Um, also, if you looked at the first, you know, maybe centimeter or something like that of this chalkboard or of any of these surfaces, you'd probably find that those temperatures are pretty close um, to the temperature in, of the air. And so uh, to account for stuff like that and to sort of slow down the dynamics of the model, we typically increase the thermal capacitance here. And so if you look just at, at empirical studies of actual buildings, you typically find that a C value that works pretty well, that matches the data, the real behavior of a building pretty well, is usually about an order of magnitude bigger than what you get from this row CV calculation. So kind of a quick, quick and dirty way to do, to, to get the C is basically just to do the row CV calculation. Again, V is something that's easy to calculate uh, and then just multiply it by about 10 to 15, somewhere in there. And if you do that, um, you get basically just this number multiplying the floor area. And here I've used a value of, uh, of three meters, I think for the height. Okay, so to summarize the R and the C stuff. Oh yes, question. Um, so what about uh, ventilation, you know, windows and doors opening, stuff like that? Um, so that wouldn't really enter into the, the C so much as it would enter into, at least in my mind, I think there are various ways you could do that, but in my mind, it would enter into this value here, the thermal transmittance of the walls and, and maybe the windows. Um, so, so yeah, when you have cracks, gaps, I mean, I, I lived in a crappy apartment 10 years ago that had like a half inch gap between the framing and the window. <laughs> and so it just like forever had cold air coming in. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like, you know, that they call it infiltration. It's basically filtering in of outdoor air or something like that. Um, and so, yeah, that basically is, is another effect. It's driven by the temperature difference between the indoor and the outdoor, and it kind of gets lumped into um, the insulation value for a wall or a window. Yeah, that's a good question. If you were thinking about um, ventilation rates, like what do you need to keep air fresh inside of a space? Um, uh, in the buildings community, people often talk about what are called air changes per hour or ACH. Um, so yeah, there you would use the volume of the space, the floor area times the height basically, and that would give you some number in cubic meters or cubic feet. And then you'd say, look, we want two air changes per hour for you know, a space like this, or if you were in a hospital, maybe you'd want 20 air changes per hour. And that would basically get you an air flow rate and you could back out, you know, how big of a fan and how big of ducts you needed to provide that. Does that make sense? <laughs> you sound a little skeptical. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, we'll chat after class, okay. Um, all right, so to summarize, um, with kind of the assumptions and the models and things like that, uh, that I have put forward here, which are not Again, not perfect, they're all approximations, but we get kind of reasonable ranges for the R and the C as a function only of the number of stories and of the floor area of the building. And uh, in here, we're assuming three foot uh, ceilings, which is kind of normal for a residential building. For a commercial, often they're a little higher. Um, so that would affect these numbers a little bit. So um, you could multiply this by four thirds or something like that. Um, and you can go back to the original calculations and, and figure out how that would work, I think, pretty easily. Um, but anyway, this gives you reasonable values. And then we talked about the time constant tau, the RC product that showed up in the uh, dynamic model here. Um, so that ends up, you know, if you need to calculate it, being about order one uh, times this, um, and I think I missed the units here actually. Um, but anyway, times uh, the floor area divided by the number of stories. And then if we look at, you know, roughly a 200 square meter house with a couple of stories, um, we have a test house off of campus that we use uh, in our research group. Actually, I think we'll probably do a tour of it um, sometime this semester. And uh, Aaron, who's in the class, lives there and we'll probably give you guys the tour. 
Um, but anyway, it has a bunch of the, the DERs that we're talking about in this class uh, in the house. But it's about 200 square meters. It's, it's a couple of blocks away from here and it's uh, about two stories. So we might find that we have an R of somewhere around three and a half for a building like that. Um, a little more if it's you know newer, better insulated, a little older if it's you know worse or it has more windows, things like that. C might be kind of around two and a half, something like that. And then the time constant might be around eight hours, roughly. These are all very squishy, very rough, but um, at least it gives you kind of plausible sort of ranges for these things. How are we doing with time? Okay, so that's the R and the C. And then the third kind of parameter or input data that enters a model like this is that thermal power from, from other stuff, from uh, lights, body heat, sun, all, all of those things. So that we can kind of decompose into um, energy from plugged in things, lights, electronics, uh, electric stoves, things like that. And then from the sun and then from everything else. So that would include you know, body heat, uh, it would include burning stuff inside the house, whether it's wood in a fireplace or, or gas at a stove. Um, so number one, uh, sometimes in the real world is, is measured. Um, so some people have, everybody has an electric meter on their house for billing, but some people have what are called sub meters, uh, which measure kind of circuit by circuit, the electricity consumption. Um, so in our test house, we have, you know, 20, 30 circuits measured, something like that. Um, <laughs> Alex is laughing because it's probably way more than that, actually. We have like three different power meters, each of which are measuring like 18 circuits or something. It's kind of ridiculous. But um, anyway, so uh, for about 100 bucks, 130 bucks, you can get um, a widget that ma measures the power used on like eight different circuits. So you could imagine taking out, um, you know, stuff like the, the heating and cooling equipment or the electric vehicle charging, and then having another uh, measurement of sort of everything else. And that would just be kind of one bulk measurement that told you how much all the lights are using, all the cooking, you know, all the uh, electronics and uh, networking equipment, computers, all that stuff. And so a reasonable way to estimate the heat gained from all those devices is just say, well, you know, power in is going to equal heat out. So take the measurement of the electric power and, and just use that as your heat transfer. Um, we will talk, uh, there will be a whole lecture on, or maybe two lectures on solar. And so we will talk in, in more detail about how to estimate, um, you know, heat gains from, from the sun. Um, but one thing that you can use is um, to get what's called irradiance data. This is basically a measurement of how sunny it is outside. And that comes in uh, units of basically power divided by a surface area. So you can take that data, uh, which you can obtain usually from a weather service. You can download it via an, an API or something. Uh, take that and multiply it by, again, the square root of n, the number of stories times the floor area, and then multiply it by this thing about 0.2. And, uh, and you get roughly kind of the, the typical heat gains of a house um, or a building, right? Um, and we'll talk more about where this stuff comes from. And, and there's all sorts of you know, fun spherical geometry you can do if you know the orientation and the size and, and the you know, uh, emissivity and things like that of the surfaces, you can get um, very accurate calculations of, of this. But usually something like this, a kind of quick and dirty thing is, is good enough. And then number three, the sort of everything else power is usually pretty small. I mean, if someone has a big fireplace and suddenly starts burning uh, a bunch of wood, it, it might not be, but usually stuff like that doesn't happen very often. Um, and the kind of everyday, you know, heat gains that you get from um, non-electric sources or things like body heat, and those are usually on the order of 100 watts per person, um, whereas the solar heat gain might be order of a couple of kilowatts. Um, so this is sort of a 10% you know, effect, something like that. So they're usually pretty small. So either you can ignore them or you can say, eh, there's five occupants in this building. We'll assume 100 watts from you know, uh, body heat and then 100 watts from other random stuff and just say, okay, about a kilowatt of, uh, of heat transfer from those sources. Okay. Um, let me pause here. We have about 15 minutes left um, and just ask, are there any kind of big picture questions about what we talked about so far? Yep. Is it really helpful for like the exogenous term? Like, I, I was just, I'm not comfortable with, you know, too much about modeling it, but would it make sense to have like, like I feel like you could get a reasonable model going for like the solar radiance and maybe potentially the electric loads, but then like with body heat and some other stuff, and even maybe with the electrical loads, just kind of model it more as like a disturbance term, right? Does that kind of make more sense or is it worth looking more into that? 
Yeah, so so the question um, is basically for the um, that exogenous heat transfer term, the QE, um, would it make sense to model it kind of more as a, a disturbance term and then maybe model it kind of stochastically or using um, probabilistic methods maybe rather than this kind of physics-based methods where you start with the sun's position and things like that. Um, yes, so we'll <laughs> that does make sense. And, and uh, certainly when we use these models in practice, like in when we're doing control of your house, <laughs> we we do that, right? We we say this is um a kind of a catch-all term. Yes, it's the sun, and yes, it's body heat, but also it's all the inaccuracies in the model. It's all the physical effects that we're not accounting for, and and so on. And so we kind of back out a data set of those, and then we use machine learning basically to to predict that data. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. We might even do that as a, a sample problem, but probably not for a month or so. Yeah, good good question. Thanks, Alex. Um, when you're calibrating the parameters, like capacitance and like the resistance and all that, do you like manually adjust it and see what works best? Or do you like look at the data and try to go figure that out and figure out how it's how to go exactly? Yeah, so I think to paraphrase the question a little bit and correct me if, I, if I'm if i wrong. Um, so if you're trying to use a model like this to do something in the real world, like to represent an actual building, um, you probably want to calibrate the parameters, the R and the C, maybe the machine learning model for the Q, stuff like that. You want to calibrate them somehow. So the question is, do you do that calibration kind of by hand, you know, fiddle with the R until something looks about right and then fiddle with the C and then, you know, um, or do we do kind of a data-driven machine learning approach? Um, so the answer is yes, <laughs> you can do either. Um, and, and oftentimes it's useful to do both. Um, so there are there's certainly a camp of people who work, for example, on building control problems who um, either don't have as much knowledge of like heat transfer effects or else just like don't don't want to worry about that stuff. And they will come up with purely data driven algorithms to fit parameters like this. And that's perfectly valid and it can work really well. Um, it's also nice, I think, to be able to do at least a back of the envelope kind of physical calculation where you're like, well, how big is the building? Is it leaky or tight? You know, is it well insulated or badly insulated? Okay, and then you get kind of, you know, like lick your thumb, stick it in the wind. At least you get kind of a, a directional kind of estimate, right? And then you can compare the two. You can say, well, my machine learning model is telling me I have an R that's a thousand, but I know it should be order one from physics. So like something is weird. <laughs> and then you go back and you recalibrate your, your modeling process or, your, or whatever. So, um, so yeah, I think it's a bit of both. And I think having the background both in the data fitting stuff and, and in a little bit of physical intuition can lead to better performance algorithms overall. Anyway, that's my take, but of course I'm biased because I do both. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, great, great questions. Yes. Oh, Sandra had a question. Um, yeah, Sandra, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I would like to ask you two questions. So the first one would be for the time constant that you calculated in slide 19. So does that have a physical meaning? So those 8.5 hours, does that mean that is the building going to reach thermal equilibrium in 8.5 hours, something like that? Or Yeah, so, so let me pause you for a sec before you get to your second question. Um, did people in the room hear the question? Yeah, okay, great. Um, so so yeah, does the time constant have a physical meaning? Um, yes, and it's actually really similar to the, the physical meaning of a time constant in a battery model. Um, so basically, uh, suppose the room is at um, you know 20 Celsius and it's zero Celsius outside, um, and then we stopped heating it at all. Um, so the time constant tells us basically how long it would take um, for the building to drift until it became essentially isothermal with the outdoor air. So, um, you know, we wrote down these numbers in the batteries section, but I think one time constant gets you about two thirds of the way there. In two time constants, you're about 85% of the way there. And in three time constants, you're about 95% of the way there. I, I think that's right. Um, so yeah, a, a building that has um, a, a bigger C because it is uh, constructed out of heavier weight materials um, would have a longer time constant and would take a longer time to basically uh, reach equilibrium with the outdoor air. Does that make sense? I see. Yep, 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 that makes sense. And then, so, like, considering all the assumptions that we did to be able to reach the simplified model, like, would you use it to, uh, like, stimulate your building to, or, like, construction, or, like, would you use it just to have initial estimate of parameters and then use something more robust, I would say, or, like, what's the extent 
that we can use this model. Yeah, so what are these models useful for? Um, so it's a good question. So, so something that they're not very useful for, for example, is, um, is design. So if you, or if I worked for um, like a green building or, or architectural firm, um, there might be engineers who work alongside architects and want to design a building you know, before it is built. And architects might come up with cool looking stuff and then engineers might be able to take that and run it through a model and come out with some information about energy performance, right? How much is it gonna cost to heat or cool the building for a year? And then they can iterate until they get on a design that basically both looks good and also is gonna be you know, cheap, low emissions, et cetera, to operate. Um, so these models, I guess you could do a, a little bit of that, like on, on co a course level, you'd know how big the building is gonna be, um, you know, st stuff like that. But um, but I think you know the tools that I mentioned at the beginning of the class, like Energy Plus and, and Transys, um, those tools I think lend themselves a little bit better to that kind of design process. Uh, and there are actually um, kind of graphical front ends, for example, for Energy Plus that architects can use to do some of that energy modeling themselves uh, without an engineer actually in, in the loop. Um, but okay, so that's so I would say not so much for like detailed architectural type design, um, but I think if you want to control a building. That's really that's really the main um, application for a model like this, is it's sort of um, accurate enough that uh, it can make reasonable predictions of how the building would behave under a different you know scenarios of how you're controlling it, and then you know in control we always use feedback. So you say my model is okay but not great, um, so I'll take measurements periodically and and change the way that I'm operating the building in order to better reflect reality. Um, so this model, uh, these type of models, these RC thermal circuit models, I think are accurate enough for that purpose. And they get used a lot for that purpose. Um, also, if you think about um, sizing, heating and cooling equipment, um, basically the way that that's typically done is, is using, I mean, people who, who do these industry methods for sizing, say how big a furnace should be for a house, um, they may not know that under the hood, kind of what they're doing is based on the equations that I showed you today, but it pretty much is. Um, kind of they use steady state versions of the same differential equations that we're using here. And they do something like estimate an R value and then get basically a heat transfer estimate through the wall. And then they oversize a little bit relative to that estimate. So um, so things like sizing, uh, design of some uh, mechanical components, um, maybe some ventilation type components, um, and then control. I would say those are the main applications of these models. And we'll do a bunch of that, by the way, um, not this week, but in coming uh, months. So Sandra, does that uh, address your, your second question? Yes, thank you. Okay, very good. Um, all right, so blah, 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 where are we here? So there's an example in this that I think I would like to get to, but I don't think we'll have time for it today. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about um, higher order thermal circuits. And then I think we'll wrap after this section. So, um, so again, we talked about basically the first order circuits and then how to get model parameters. Um, but what if you have, you know, a control system in a big building, you know, some fancy office building that has 100 rooms, or you're trying to come up with a control scheme or, or equipment design for a skyscraper in New York that has 50 stories, um, something like that. So then it probably doesn't make sense to just say, ah, everything is about the same temperature, right? You probably want to think about, oh, some people like their apartments cool, other like them, others like them warmer, and, and to have some differentiation between um, what are called those thermal zones. So for that purpose, you might want to use a higher order um, model. And here I'm just illustrating kind of the, the simplest version of a non-first order, so a second order uh, thermal circuit. And here, this looks a lot like the 2R1C circuit that I mentioned before, um, but rather than having essentially a, a battery, a voltage source here, uh, it has an energy storage element, a capacitor, um, corresponding to the thermal mass of the building. So um, we can think of this as a model of this space. Uh, maybe we're uh, forgetting about heat transfer to the other you know, adjacent rooms. And we're just thinking about the thermal mass of all these cinder blocks and, uh, and then the thermal mass of the air. And so all that concrete would be in here and the mass of the air, and then maybe you know, things like metal and the ducts and stuff uh, would be in the sea. And then same deal, we've got uh, thermal resistances connecting the indoor temperature to the mass temperature and the indoor temperature to the outdoors. And here you could put another resistance that would connect the mass um, to the outdoors as well. So if we were thinking about the cinder blocks and the exterior walls, we might want to do something like that. And you can use the same process, basically do a, a, a Kirchhoff law, a, a current conservation um, or charge conservation rather at this node, and that gives you one equation. And then you can do the same thing at this node and you get a second uh, differential equation. 
So the first one looks just like the 2R1C equation. And then the second one here is quite simple. It's just basically, uh, you know, the charge rate accumulation over here. That's our, our CM uh, times the time derivative of the mass temperature. And then the current flowing um, through this resistor uh, is equal to, uh, it's just an Ohm's law type thing, a delta T divided by R. Yes. So for your example of like, all the different like apartment rooms in like one building, everybody wants to have a specific temperature. Would that like, would those inputs of like those boundary temperatures in the circuit, would that like over constrain the circuit in some case, or would it all always work out like no matter what, no matter if it was just like super high gradient of like room temperatures, would that over constrain the circuit in some cases? So to paraphrase your question, um, so what if we were in the, the sort of multi-zone, maybe an apartment building type example? Um, so what if you know we had an apartment above us, another one below us, and then maybe two on the sides, something like that, and then the outdoor air. So we've got like five different boundary temperatures. Um, does that over constrain the circuit? Like, does the model become intractable in that setting? Um, so the answer is no. And the way to do it basically would just be to add more R's and then either attach temperature measurements and, and energy storage to those adjacent zones, or else just treat them as kind of boundaries. Like, the air conditioner in my neighbor's apartment is going to keep their room at 72 no matter what I do. Um, so I'm just going to assume it's a, a fixed 72 degrees or whatever. And then, yeah, um, you can, uh, at that point, uh, you can do some simplification, some algebra to basically reduce it, um, maybe do a circuit that looks like this, or maybe even to a, a first order, you know, a one, one R, one C type circuit um, through that, you know, the equivalent resistance, equivalent boundary temperature through that math that I showed earlier. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. All right, so um, you'll notice I haven't highlighted these equations. Um, I do think that you know models like this, higher order models are, are useful. Again, I've said it like three times, but it's a good tool to have in your toolbox. But I think like 80 to 90% of the time, um, you can get uh, pretty far with whatever kind of analysis you wanna do or control you wanna do by just using a very simple first order model. Um, but okay, let's look at what the discrete time dynamics for this higher order model look like. Um, so you can take the governing equations and write them as a system of equations. Um, where the state is uh, the indoor temperature, the indoor air temperature, and the thermal mass temperature. And then we have these matrices and so forth. And so this has the form of a linear dynamical system. And you can do the algebra to show that, that these are what the, uh, the matrices and, and the disturbance um, should look like. And then in our lecture on linear dynamical systems, we learned how to discretize them in time. And so here um, is, is basically how we do that. And we use the matrix exponential down here. And then we've got the definition of our, our discrete time B matrix, which is different from the, the B tilde that, that shows up up here. So this is basically just uh, a special case of the, the general equations that I showed for how to linearize a, a linear, uh, sorry, how to discretize a linear dynamical system. Um, and then, okay, so here maybe we have uh, a new, new parameters that are coupling um, the indoor air to uh, the thermal mass. So we need um, an R for that uh, thermal resistance, basically between the air and the, the concrete and, and stuff um, in, in the building. And so that typically an empirical fix is, is kind of about an order of magnitude bigger than uh, the value that you get from C, uh, the air and, and the uh, sort of shallow thermal mass of the building. So CM might be, you might call it like the deeper thermal mass of the building. Um, now this is gonna vary depending on the materials and the construction, You know, if you have some gigantic, you know, a huge four foot thick concrete uh, in, indoor wall for some weird reason, uh, if you live in a castle, I guess, um, you know, then then this uh, probably isn't about, or isn't the right uh, equation, but, you know, for typical buildings that you'd find in the US, I think it's kind of reasonable. And then um, again, typically we have the uh, coupling between the air uh, and the thermal mass uh, stronger than the coupling between the indoor air and, and the outdoor air. And the reason for that is we typically insulate exterior walls uh, but interior walls don't get insulated. And so it's easier for heat to transfer from the air to the, the interior thermal mass. And then uh, if you want a sanity check, you can run this kind of calculation. You know, Again, C just basically comes from thermal physical properties of air and uh, the volume, so geometry of the space. And then you, you, know, you find C and then you multiply by 10 or whatever to get the CM. And if you want a, a thermal, sorry, a sanity check, you can divide by this number here, um, which I have calculated. And it comes from basically the density and the specific heat capacity of, of pine. So you take CM and divide it by 0.3, and that gives you in cubic meters roughly the volume of, of pine that you're thinking about. So if you're like, oh, I, uh, I have some model, again, maybe some machine learning model that I fit that's telling me I have a, a million uh, kilowatt hours per uh, degree, 
as my thermal mass temperature. And then you think about, okay, is that reasonable? Well, how much pine would that be? How much would it weigh? How big would it be? You know, if it was a cube, what, what would its footprint be? And then you can say, okay, is that reasonable for the building that I'm looking at or, or not? Um, okay, it's 415. So I will stop there and we'll talk about something called two timing, um, which is basically recognizing that there are two different kind of characteristic time scales in these models that have both air and also thermal mass in them. And so you can take your second order equation and basically write it with pretty good accuracy, approximate it as two um, coupled first order equations. Um, okay, we'll start with that on Thursday. Um, 